Hi everyone, Sean Duca. A generation ago, there was a lot of talk as about the oil as a new currency. But today, however, there's an increasing evidence that data is, in fact, becoming a new currency and a trend is likely to accelerate. At the core of this ability is to build and benefit from a cyber mesh of data, we can't overlook the need for intelligent cyber risk identification and the mitigation practices in order for us to build and prosper from the digitization of everything. This is an extract from Rama Vedashree's Navigating the Digital Age article. Today, I'm joined by Rama Vedashree, who is the Chief Executive Officer at the Data Security Council in India. She previously was the Vice President of NASCOM, overseeing a wide range of initiatives, including domestic IT, e-governance, smart cities, and healthcare. She's also held as executive positions at Microsoft and General Electric. Rama, thank you very much. and really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you, Sean. So if I think about it from a uh, threat protection when it comes to crown jewels in every organization, you know, recent evidence have really have thrust cybersecurity into the spotlight. The threat landscape continues to evolve and intensify exponentially. Personal identifiable information has increased in value and our growing reliance on digital identities and digital service delivery has made it even more accessible. There's a substantial shift in thinking by most organizations that the data is most valuable, is the most valuable currency. So Rami, if I can ask you the question, how do you protect data in today's threat landscape? Thank you, Sean. First of all, thank you for having me in your Ignite 21 forum. Always a pleasure to talk to you and your colleagues. Oh, essentially, I mean, you really set the context well. Well, particularly post pandemic, the digitization wave across all verticals, whether it is public services, government to citizen online services, retail, and if you even look at edutech and healthcare, there is a massive wave of digitization and migration to the cloud. In addition to the core enterprise verticals, whether it is banking, financial services, digital payments. So oh, it's not just because there is the data uh, drives the digital economy of any country and data and innovation is really driving the growth charter of most enterprises serving consumers. It's also because there is a lot of regulatory attention to protection of data and mitigating cyber risks. There is also a lot of in, uh, heightened expectations from consumers. I think it's uh, the enterprises need to look at protecting their crown jewels and core enterprise data, not because of just their business uh, you know, priorities, but it's also because they need to meet the expectations of their consumers and citizens who expect those heightened best practices. So uh, cyber is getting a lot of attention from regulators across all verticals, from government, nodal institutions, and also from investors and of course boards of the enterprises. So cybersecurity strategy looking at a completely enhanced business resilience plan for the uh, company. And how do you mitigate the risks? Because it's not just financial losses, it's reputation risk. It's sometimes exodus of uh, your consumer base whenever there is a data breach or there is a protection. So uh, whether it's in terms of how do you collaborate with uh, sectors across various verticals, uh, how do you uh, collaborate with the certs of your countries, and what is the new technology platforms that you deploy as you migrate to the cloud? There's a lot of attention on cloud security. There's a lot of attention on a technology enabled privacy and data protection uh, preservation. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, some very good points there. And even if I was to sort of think about it as well, uh, and sort of touching on those key pieces, one is really around the fact that, you know, whilst we've got those regulatory frameworks and there's a lot of you know, regulators that are actually just sort of generally out there that we're dealing with on a regular basis. You know, the consumer is ultimately becoming one of those new regulators for them as well. Which really sort of leads me into, I guess, one of the next key pieces, which is around zero trust for privacy and people. And I know that this is a topic that's, that's close to your heart. You know, customers want that reassurance of knowing their interactions and data is secure, you know, without any inconvenience. Uh, between frictionless yet visible security, this is delicate balancing act, which is sometimes potentially has a positively impact on an organization's bottom line, reputation and trustworthiness. Now, in your eyes, how do you actually believe an organization can deliver on the privacy promise? One thing, I mean, I want to just uh, start with and in the last one year or 18 months, as we talk to CISOs across verticals, uh, zero trust is no longer a buzzword. Uh, it is getting really evaluated 
when we talked to some global CISOs, I was speaking to moderating a panel with a couple of global CISOs in one of NASCOM's cloud summit. They've already rolled off, particularly post pandemic. There's a lot of board attention to zero trust. I do agree you talked about frictionless. It's extremely important that the cognitive burden on the user is reduced. Uh, this October as part of Cybersecurity Awareness Month, when I was addressing leadership team of an oil and gas company, They've already done the assessment and readiness for zero trust. The important thing is zero trust is not something that can just, voila, you have got a board mandate and you roll it out. Your organization needs to be prepared to be able to adopt this new paradigm. So one thing I see is as organizations undertake the journey for zero trust, uh, at least the baseline of their security and you know, privacy preparedness would enhance a lot because they will discover a lot of gaps, possibly legacy infrastructure, a lot of retired applications. Uh, user awareness is something that is getting a lot of attention. So what we see is, what I see when we talk to a lot of CISOs across all verticals is, everybody is going in a phased manner. They're looking at what are those critical assets, uh, networks, devices, and probably users. And in, in the future, we see a lot around workloads and applications, all of them getting encompassed into this uh, zero trust paradigm. And also look at uh, how do you implement so that the users also uh, are adequately trained. It's not just your technical staff, but your end users, your field workforce, your partner organizations. And as we look at deploying a lot of emerging technologies, which are getting mainstream in and integrated and in your typically what is now being called as a borderless enterprise network, I think how do you make sure that authorization and authentication happens particularly for these new league of devices, IoT devices on your shop floors or in smart cities. I think this is what is getting a lot of attention. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's one thing that we keep on seeing sort of more often than not, obviously that, you know, that continual need that it really is that sort of mind shift. It's not necessarily just you know, it's a board mandate, let's go for it. There has to be a fundamental driver for that. So if I kind of think about it from a specifically down to the industries now, and you know, any company uh, who's possessing sensitive data is under threat of being breached. You know, the risk is especially high if your company belongs to one of the industries, one of the most exposed industries, you know, top five being healthcare, financial services, retail, and the public sector. You know, Robert, in your eyes, what, what steps can these industries take uh, to protect, better protect their critical assets? And do you think there are, I guess, some specific things in each of those industries as well? I think banking financial services have always led the way on, uh, you know, uh, higher attention to cyber adopting technologies. Now, I think worldwide post pandemic healthcare being targeted. Healthcare is something that is getting a lot of attention. Recently, we did a privacy and security strategy session for 100 CIOs. Uh, I think all CIOs and CISOs of healthcare are really gearing up. I think it's extremely important to first do a comprehensive reassessment of what your preparedness is. Because I think a lot of things have changed post COVID because now it's not just everybody working from your office premises behind your secure networks, on your secure networks. There's a lot that is open. Several of your workforce and partner organizations are working anytime, anywhere. So how do you make sure in this paradigm uh, what is the new threat landscape? What are those vulnerabilities, particularly as your users are working from home and uh, working on time times, you know, not so secure Wi-Fi networks. So I think doing a fresh assessment of what your enterprise assets are, where are they distributed? Where are access points distributed? There's a lot that has got migrated to the cloud. So I would say a comprehensive revisit of what your enterprise IT network footprint is all about. Second, you obviously you can't at one point suddenly roll out zero trust across the enterprise. I think you need to evaluate what would be your prioritized assets and have a phased manner and start. That's what we understand when we talk to CIOs and CISOs, including many global corporations, that they've uh, done they've done an assessment. They've decided to roll out a complete zero trust network architecture, but they've prioritized in a phased manner, looking at network devices and users, and possibly later would be applications. 
and lot of them might need a little bit of a revisit of how they do authorization and authentication and how do you move the cognitive burden of the users taking more to how do you make sure that it is enabled by systems so that the entire shift left and whenever they looking at new applications roll out or new there's a lot that is being offered on the mobile platforms post covid there's so much that is happening on contactless payments to be able to integrate digital payments into the way you service your consumers and citizens i think in all of this how do you make sure that you leverage technology for a little more full proof authentication and authorization excellent okay um so if i think about it now uh, obviously dan in oh, sorry in, in the us in may this year uh, the us president joe biden issued an executive order on cybersecurity seeking to improve the state of national cybersecurity in the us and with the us facing persistent and increasingly sophisticated malicious cyber campaigns that threaten the public sector the private sector and ultimately the american people's and security and privacy the biden administration really seen announced the executive order mandating that organizations must adopt zero practices zero um must adopt security best practices including advances towards zero trust architecture and platform as a service among others you know what impacts could this have on the rest of the world and what measures can or should other government agencies put in place to protect their economies and their people yes i think uh, the biden administrative order and the recent uh, you know declaration by several global tech companies headquartered in the us uh, you know offering to partner with government to mitigate the cyber risk that's a great step of course the, the biden administrative order will apply to the us and its industry but typically there will be a lot of learnings for other governments Uh, we do know that even when the president uh, prime minister of india visited to the us cyber was a very important dialogue uh, you are also familiar with this new quadrilateral initiative uh, which is uh, you know us india japan and australia uh, we do know that emerging technologies and the cyber risks of emerging technologies is one of the very big tracks uh, the way i would see whenever there's a country which takes the lead on this it's not only their industry members and various user organizations in that country there's a lot that happens in the government to government dialogues and collaborations india because us and india are big trading partners india is a big global hub for which services majority of us corporations so we do see a big significant influence both in terms of cert cooperation or uh, government to government dialogues and also industry and where we see a uh, positive influence of such administrative orders is organizations like nist coming up with new frameworks and uh, that having a positive influence on the rest of the industry uh, whether it is user enterprises or the technology companies which are building products uh, both on the cloud platform or uh, you know saas uh, solutions so i do see uh, increased cooperation and dialogue between the two countries particularly industry members and government but also this new quadrilateral initiative i think uh, given the new supply chain risk uh, dynamics uh, i think there would be a lot of focus i do understand that all the four countries have agreed on a collaboration frameworks and uh, nist is going to play a role in uh, developing new standards and frameworks i think that would be a big uh, positive influence for the rest of us So Ram has some really good points there around today's threat landscape and if I was to really sort of summarize what I see as the one of the biggest challenges and threats that that's really sort of increasing and has been for some time is really that threat around supply chain. Uh you know how do you see what the over the horizon what do you see that actually sort of looks like in terms of supply chain attacks and, and threats targeting organizations today? I think in any critical information infrastructure particularly whether it's oil and gas you know or the aviation networks and of course banking and financial services which are large global platforms there's a lot of focus around uh, supply chain security and it has a uh, new facets to prep uh, previously when we looked at supply chain security it was all about securing your devices and mandating the necessary testing and certifications and you were reasonably sure that you were integrating secure products onto your uh, information assets right there is now when you look at supply chain security i think the new league of targeted attacks gets a lot of attention and it's not just devices and networks but overall there is 
a lot of focus which is not just about mandating testing and certification but also making sure that every risk and potential vulnerabilities are assessed and sometimes these vulnerabilities need not be targeted attacks but it could also be sometimes uh, the vulnerabilities because of the zero day attacks and all of that so it is getting lot more attention at a government and national security apparatus in india there is a lot of focus particularly from regulators of telecoms power sector because i think those critical information infrastructure assets are what are being most targeted so we believe that even uh, this quadrilateral initiative supply chain security is one of the tracks and one of the four countries is actually taking the lead on that manufacturing sector is another which is giving a lot of attention yes yeah, so if i actually sort of dig a little bit deeper on that one as well um and even if you think about the concept of data grids that you sort of you talked about in your, your chapter as well there was really a big focus on you know protecting the information that's obviously there as we as we sort of talking about today you know with supply chain it's been obviously a big drive for people to really localize a lot of their information and keep it in the confines that the the I guess the geography and the, the physical boundaries of a of a country does that make things safer or more secure than than anything else that we've been doing today no i don't particularly agree to that viewpoint i think security and privacy and data residency in a certain geography uh, are uh, don't really guarantee data residency in a certain geography does not really guarantee security or privacy uh, of course there is uh, for some of the critical information infrastructure we are seeing a growing trend of demanding you know local products and localization of uh, data but i do see them as uh, not really directly having an impact on security and privacy but if you look at some of the um, global directions that we are seeing i think there would be a little more harmonization of privacy regulations and the security mandates that are coming because when you look at in a digitized world when you look at supply chain it is a global supply chain whenever you look at the entire provider ecosystem in your digitization journey of any enterprise whether it's banking oil and gas it's not that all your providers are going to be from one country it is a completely globalized supply chain whether it comes to networks devices applications startup security products or startup solutions and fintech products they may be coming from any country right you are always looking at the cutting edge of technology and not limiting yourself from procuring that technology only from a provider of your country in such a world i think we need to look at how do you make sure that governments and industry cooperate so that the frameworks for mitigating the risks coming up with more robust certification and assurance mechanism i think there's a lot that needs to be done in many countries including india on how do we scale up the testing and assurance mechanism so that everything that is getting deployed in critical information infrastructure has the necessary assurance so that we are doing what we need to do to be able to mitigate of course after we do everything there could still be an attack but at least we would have put in all the effort that is needed to prepare ourselves against potential risks particularly i would say in critical information infrastructure excellent yeah it's uh, definitely something that's uh, that's consistently sort of growing as well and i think it's the as the threat itself is is borderless you know we to ensure that we're uh, borderless without thinking of how we sort of uh like a store out and use our data as well so my question if we if we're continually spending more on security why do we continue to see attacks rising all the time that's a good question i think whenever we look at any new technology there's a dark side of technology and i think cyber criminals are a lot more organized now uh the ai and machine learning which is getting leveraged for security products and solutions are also being leveraged by the cyber criminals there's a lot of targeted attacks in the post covid world because there are users working from anywhere and probably the awareness that we are building among our consumers and your entire workforce maybe the technical workforce are a little more aware uh, i think users or gullible users are getting targeted with the phishing campaigns there is a probably geopolitical dimension to the cyber attacks so i would say technology would there would always be a dark side to that 
and criminals would continue to attack that and cyber is the new front for warfare for crippling economies for uh, you know bringing down a sector or bringing down a critical infrastructure which has a larger impact another challenge that we are seeing is cyber criminals targeting services companies to amplify their attack across multiple customers before i think when there was an attack the attack was on a specific enterprise or a sector but now services being the new spot a new uh, front from which attacks are being launched against multiple customers is definitely a new worry and uh, i think as government as national security institutions and of course industry members we need to really step up on how do we procure uh, how do we protect services companies which are uh, serving several critical information infrastructures i think they are now the new points of attack excellent yeah it's uh, it's interesting how you sort of mentioned the, the dark side of technology it's probably akin to security that obviously being that real problem for most organizations and you know attackers really leveraging and using that to their own advantage um Okay, so just well, I guess one final question, uh, and that's really around, you know, kind of the way forward. Uh, and we talked about zero trust around preventing breaches, and and the thought that uh, it's it's really around making sure that we can make it as hard as possible for an attacker to to really get access to those crown jewels. You know, beyond what what do you believe we need to do beyond zero trust to actively monitor for threat activity in our organisations? I would say zero trust has to be something that is continuously assessed and evolved it's not that you have done a one time implementation and it's all good to go the second one i would say as you migrate more and more workloads to the cloud and start leveraging a lot of the saas based products it's extremely important cloud security gets a lot more attention both from the user enterprise but also the cloud platform providers and the a managed service providers which are you know particularly the service provider between the cloud platform vendor and the user enterprise i can't uh, not emphasize more on continued user awareness and training and users is uh, not just your workforce but your workforce and also the consumers that you are uh, uh, serving i think user awareness is an extremely important one because we have seen the targeted phishing attacks it's essentially the user awareness which is helping uh, prevent that right or mitigate that so i would say user awareness is another one another new trend that we are seeing is over the years privacy implementation was always about process policy user awareness there is now uh, uh, selecting the right technology to implement your privacy solutions and discovering what exactly is the personal data across your enterprise across the life cycle of you know, servicing a consumer i think privacy technology are getting a lot of momentum i do see a lot of investment that's going on wherever there is a, a new privacy legislation privacy technologies along with the cyber security is and platforms on that is something that i think will get increased attention we are seeing that in india while we are waiting for the personal data protection bill to be enacted most large companies servicing in a b2c world have already started gearing up their preparedness and evaluating technologies for privacy and when you scan the landscape of new security products and startups we are seeing an emerging plethora of privacy technologies this is one area cloud on one side privacy and endpoint protection i think these are the three facets which would get the major uh, share of the wallet of the spend of a cio and cis okay so fascinating stuff and once again thank you very much rob we really appreciate it uh if i was to try and summarize uh, all the amazing little uh, the points and key pieces that we sort of focused on you talked about some of those threats and i guess the, the key thing for any organization irrespective of what sector you're actually in you know protecting your crown jewels is an absolute imperative you know whether it be personal identifiable information uh, or the secret formula for a brand new recipe if you're a pharmaceutical company uh, for a brand new drug it's all about ensuring that we can actually provide protection to the most valuable currency that you've actually got being your own data you know supply chain attacks keep on growing and, and no doubt based on what rather said we'll probably continue to see this continue to see this for a number of years to come but it's all about working together it's all about working and ensuring that 
you know, is better together. You know, the more that we can actually start to talk and share about what we're seeing, how an adversary is actually targeting us, and actually share with that and learning from that, the more we can actually start to ensure that we're protecting our own organisations. And that's really around the fact that if we don't talk, it's played to the hand of the attackers. And when we talked about the fact that, you know, the world is, uh, you know, borderless in the sense of cybercrime can effectively target any organisation from anywhere around the world. You know, our mindset really needs to be shifting around providing that data or allowing the data to actually freely work in any geography, irrespective of where it actually sits. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the same country. But we still need to ensure that we maintain the security, the privacy elements all around all of that. You know, when it comes down to providing protection, you know, in a world where we've got regulation, we've got the, the need to ensure that we've got maintaining governance and assurance in every single facet that we do in our working lives. And as we start to shift out and leverage more technology, we always need to be thinking about how do we provide privacy protection because the, the customer or the consumer is going to be the new regulator that we're going to keep on seeing. They're going to be instilling trust in us in every single facet of what they do with us and interacting with each of our organisations. You know, we start to see that the top five most targeted organisations and industries have been healthcare, financial services, retail, public sector. Again, if you're not one of those top five, it doesn't mean that you're immune to cyber attacks, that that need to continually apply protection to all of your assets is an absolute imperative. And as we keep on seeing these new types of technology coming out, you know, and we're going to see that there's always going to be someone who will try and disrupt our ability to confidently embrace those technology, uh, those technologies. We need to keep on thinking about how do we ensure that we're leveraging the best out of those technologies that are actually out there, moving that security or moving away that technical debt that we've actually got and ensuring that we are using some of the latest technologies, but ensuring that we can actually provide some level of protection. So once again, Rama, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. It was wonderful talking to you.